Um, I'm, I'm just really excited to learn more about your process and, and techniques. It, it's your illustrations are just stunning. Oh, well, thank you so much. Well, um, I love your paint palette. So <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody okay. who's joining us, I just will let you um, this is a live demo um, a series with um, botanical illustrator Lara Gastinger. So um, if you haven't already checked out her Instagram, I've got it up here and um, so excited. Laura, would you want to just start by sharing a little bit about your background as an sure. artist? Sure. So, um, I, first of all, I started my career as, um, I thought I was going to be a field botanist and I went to, um, UVA and then Virginia Tech and I got a master's in plant ecology and I thought I was going to work in the field. And then I heard about the Flora Virginia project. And then I became an illustrator for that. And I drew plants for 10 years for that book. And then um, after that, I just I started doing more watercolors and commissions and painting and um, started my perpetual journal. Would you share a little bit more about your perpetual journal too? I was taking a peek on your Instagram and diving into that. Oh. And it's really inspiring. Sorry. Yes. Um, let's see, I have it right here. I don't know if you can see everything about it, but uh, the whole idea is that um, the um, journal is, I'll try to zoom out here. Each page is stamped with um, a date or I, I write a date and it just, each year you just go back to the page you're on of that week. So um, this last week I entered some, um, I entered this in here. So one page might have multiple years on it. Oh, that's marvelous. Okay. Then you get a chance to like revisit the mm -hmm. season and the date with another year mm -hmm. and, and see your progress too. And just, or how your eyes have changed. Yes. And I just realized this next week has hardly anything in it. So I should do something. <laughs> oh, that's inspiring. Um, oh, I just see a question Thank about you. paints. Um, and we both, I'll just say, we won't say too much about it, but um, this is a little sneak peek at a palette we have at Art Toolkit in the works. And I sent one to Lara too, to play with. Um, it's got eight colors and um, I don't want to say too much about it, except they're Daniel Smith paints. Oh, um, okay. And, oh, we, 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 we can give a little sneak peek. Oh. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we've got eight colors in it. And um, so, uh, with the Daniel Smith and other colors, you can you can learn more about what works well with the palette. I found um, the I've got some tutorials on filling them. Um, Laura, would you talk about some of the materials you use with your work, like favorite brushes or paper you work on? Sure. So um, in my journals, I like the Fabriano Artistico paper. Um, sometimes that's hard to find. So, um, but I like hot press, heavyweight, smooth paper. And then um, the brushes I like are. I'm in my studio, I like Raphael brushes, Kolinsky, mm -hmm. size uh, two or four. And I don't use pencil except for, for this demonstration. I use some pencil and I just use pen in the journals. Mm -hmm. Do you so have I a favorite keep... pen or pen size you work on? Yes, Micron Pens 003. Yeah. 003, tiny, tiny. <laughs> it is tiny. And so, but I keep my... um field journal with the pen separate from mm -hmm. the painting at my desk. So I don't do, I won't do pen in here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, I, I'm one of these people, I like to talk as I'm painting. So yeah. is, can I just like, I was just going to go ahead and just say the first thing I do is I just I already drew it out. And but you uh -huh. can keep asking me questions um, yeah. as I go along. But um, I was just going to put down washes because that's just oh, absolutely ooh, oops, wrong color. And I Love picked it. up a um, um, bok choy. a bok choy from my garden. It's a little bit chewed on. And so I will lightly trace the outline. And maybe as I sketch this, you could talk to me a little bit about some of the things you notice as you sketch your, um, your objects. De well, definitely. So the first thing I do, though, is I, I really just put like a, a wash over the whole thing. Um, and so I'm doing a Swiss chard leaf which I, I sent you earlier. Let's see here. It's, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. And because I, after I got your palette and it had all the um, reddish color inside, I was like, oh, I should do Swiss chard. So um, let's see. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm new at this. 
I have a different camera when I do demos. And so I, I rarely use my phone. Oh, no problem. It looks great. It's like, I always bump into it. Um, so I just start with a wash. Um, paying attention to the shape of the leaf and the venation is really important. So I definitely do that. Let me just get focused in here. And can you talk too about what you decide to leave in and out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Let me just, I guess I'm just trying to get in the center of this. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, so I always put in the venation and lightly so you can see I have that sort of lightly sketched in in here mm -hmm. and um and then I can use that as a guide as I as I as I go along here uh and so um I put in I just make sure the size is accurate and then I um yeah I'll just put in the venation and the um so I start with the mid vein when I'm drawing the plant and then I do the outline and then I do the side veins so that's the way I do it. So after I put in like a wash, then I'll come back and I'll just say, okay, what is, what's the darkest areas here? And then I'll just really start coming back and putting in those uh, dark areas, leaving, leaving in the light areas. Once so you've, this, uh -huh. yeah. and, and you're working already on a damp sheet of paper. It is. And usually I don't, this is not like the stage I like working on the best because uh -huh. it, it is to, um, I, I find that it actually, it's, there's a lot of, um, not, there's not a huge amount of control. I like it when it gets into the dry brush stage and it's just almost like drawing. <laughs> Do you ever use uh, colored pencils? Um, no, I don't, but I know a lot, a lot of people really do. So, um, but no, uh, like Wendy Hollander, she uses colored pencils and no, I just use watercolors and these are great watercolors the Daniel Smith ones that you put in here I really really like it the colors you put in here I really like the way the two the the is it the jadeite and the green gold how they mix together well I'll give a little clue to everyone it's a, a garden theme and it's going to be coming very soon um, so if you sign up for our mailing list you'll be the first to hear when they're available fingers crossed next week um, and uh, part of our little palette of play series. So I'm playing catch up on my hand here to get my, my little outline. And um, that's so cool. You, you thought you'd start out from a, as a scientist. You've got really the scientific mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how do you feel that really informs kind of how you see the plants as you sketch them or um, what you bring into your journals? Well, actually, I think it makes me a, a better artist because um, I, I know plant names and plant families. And so I do feel like I know what I'm supposed to be paying attention to, mm -hmm. to, accurate, to accurately draw it. So um, I think there is a huge advantage in that. So do you have sort um, of a running, a running commentary in your head of what you're sketching or? Um... Um, no, but like, so I, I definitely know, um, like what to be looking for and what mm -hmm. how to draw something accurately and drawing plants accurately is definitely a part of botanical art. Um, I love on your palette how you have this little um, surface for mixing the colors. I think that is that's one of my favorite parts about your palettes, by the way, <laughs> the little mixing part. It does make it harder when you sometimes know the plant and you're just um, yeah, there is this part of my journal where um, if you don't know the plant, it doesn't really matter because I encourage people to just explore and just observe as much as they can see. And I always tell people, it doesn't matter if you're not a good artist, maybe you just write down observations about the plant. In the end, we all just are trying to be more mindful and observant of the world around us. So that's what in the, the journal is In about. this period, where do you find yourself getting most of your inspirations? Are you, do you have a garden space or a local green space? Or are you working on commissions right now? What does... Um, a little your... bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, I live in a, a semi-urban area. And so um, we take walks. The kids and I take walks. And um, I find things on the sidewalks. Um, but I do have a beautiful native plant garden in the backyard. And so I have lots of really beautiful... Um, specimens there and then uh, we do go hiking um, we're near the Shenandoah National Park so we go we go hiking on the weekend but um, 
you know, you can't pick plants in national parks. So I just take a lot of photos. Actually, I do a lot of work from photos. Um, and I always encourage people to, um, yeah, don't pick the plant and work from photos, especially in the journal. I, I'm always hiking with people that are hiking too fast. And so, or even if you pick something in my dive, um, <laughs> doesn't look the same once you've picked it. Well, like even, even the Swiss chard has wilted. So, um, that's why I also did a, here, I did a, a reference photo and I printed it up too. So this oh, is fabulous. Like, that, that's what it looked like. And also when it was fresh and also I have the light from the upper left side when, uh, when I take my picture. So I have a consistent light source. I, so the question is if I put only put native plants in my journal and actually I, I do tend to just stick with um, native and naturalized plants. So I do feature non-native plants, but um, I don't feature domesticated garden plants. So, and I like to restrict my journal to just the um, Blue Ridge and Piedmont of Virginia. Uh huh. How long have you been working on your perpetual journal? I've been keeping it since 2001. Whoa. I know. What first inspired you? Just like wanting to learn the plants. And um, it was really my husband's idea to set it up like that. And uh, so I, I give him a lot of credit for that. And um, yeah, just to be a better observer and then to just learn what the plants, plants were. I mean, it was after the flora of Virginia. So, hey, Sarah, Sarah would like us to really talk about the, your paints. We thing. can talk a little bit more about it. People here will get the sneak preview. <laughs> um, well, Sarah and everyone else, um, the eight colors here, I think we can tell them the colors. Um, uh, these are Daniel Smith. And so we have, uh, see if I can remember off the top of my head, lemon yellow, deep scarlet, quinacridone pink, carbazol violet, phthalo blue red shade, jadeite, green gold and cobalt turquoise. And um, I have um, another local friend too, who I'm, uh, I'm also I'm collaborating with on this palette who I will reveal next week, but it, it is a garden theme. And so with Lara's work, I thought it would be really fun to give the palettes a, a test run. And um, it's uh, going to be part of our palette of place series. So this is a limited edition series we're doing of palettes themed around different landscapes or places. And so thinking about the garden and um, we'll, uh, we'll be coming soon in just a limited number. Um, so if you're interested in it, um, staying tuned to my mailing list will be the first place to hear about it. And um, I'm so glad you like the colors, Laura. That means a lot to I, me. <laughs> I do like the colors. I also love the little size. I, it was, it's so cute um what's the blank space for is that for me to put like my nether color or what's yeah, this? or for mixing you can use it for mixing or if you have any other colors you want to put in i think it's a really cute little layout too so it is um <laughs> it's one of my favorites with the eight colors around it um and yeah. if anyone ever wants to you know make these white um you could spray enamel it or do some white nail polish or something um sometimes i just use the silver too you know so to like my I, I have i have my other one um and that I have a bigger one of yours. See, I actually never even filled the wells up all the way, but this is the other one I have. And I put in, I did see, I don't usually have a green, but I do like having a green. And maybe a green is nice in a field journal, but I have um, t some yellows, two reds, some blues. And then I like all these um, really warm colors that actually John Muir Laws uses in his journals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I have out two. This is the Expeditionary Art Palette, which is based on what I use in the field. And I'm, my work has been really more inspired with um, the Arctic and Antarctica and these kind of vast, more spare landscapes. So my comfort zone with green is personally a little bit lower. Um, so it's oh. very blue and earth tone. I mean, actually, it mixes some some marvelous greens. Um, but I, I agree when you're in the field, having a shortcut green can be nice um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for working really quickly. So what's your have you traveled up? there to, like what do you what's your or how do you get get to the Antarctic what are you oops sorry. yeah um well the so the art toolkit is inspired by my work with expeditionary art so uh 
since about 2004, my passion has been to travel and paint and to try and um, collaborate with scientists to help tell stories of climate change and their research through art. Uh, and so the latest trip I did was last summer up to Alaska um, to work with a field biologist named um, George Devoki, who studies birds. Wow, that is so cool. Um, and I have plans for an exhibition. Everything has been pushed back by um, sure. the shutdowns and Corona. Um, I, having my young daughter, I haven't been able to paint as much in my studio. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so life is just I, I know rolling I... with the punches right now is what I feel. Um, yes. Yes. But yeah, my passion, I actually, so I laughed when I thought you heard you talk about thinking you'd be a, a botanist. Um, I always thought I'd be a field biologist and really loved, um, love that element of, you know, being outside and looking at things really closely and learning mm -hmm. about them. But the art path is, um, I've always been an artist as well and spoke really loudly to me. Yeah, uh -oh. definitely, definitely. So, um, Carolyn asked, who, who are you? <laughs> and well, yeah, my yeah. name's Maria. I'm the founder and um, of, Ex of Art Toolkit. So you can see my other work over at Expeditionary Art. And um, Laura, I am not being as intentional with like these great white spaces as you in my, in my leaf here. That's okay. Mine was really a lot shinier than yours. So uh I don't, I mean, you saw the picture of my leaf. It's, it's very, it was really shiny. I think right? that's a nice um, tip you had of that you do work from photos. And do you do like color studies first when you're outside to help you remember colors? Oh, no. So, I mean, the, the work I do in my field journal is not as detailed as what I would do like as a, as a formal painting. So um, my field journal, when I do the, uh, colors I'm really just adding suggestions of colors or just trying to figure out things but um no it's it's not as now if I was creating a painting of this I would maybe do some color studies and details of that but for my field journal it's it's very loose it's very it's not as um let's see um like it's not as formal um do you ever sketch things other than plants like yeah, sometimes, sometimes I do mm -hmm. insects <laughs> but mm -hmm. that's I uh stop at insects probably yes uh, when, when mean, you're working with insects are you like catching little things to sketch or using um, there was a there was a time when I, w I was painting like insects from my uh garden and like the cucumber beetle and I would just um you know I, I would freeze them right and mm -hmm. and then I would just draw from that but um now I do like I did a millipede the other day and that was from a photograph so um yeah I don't but rarely if, if, I mean I like butterflies but I think um I've, I mean if you find something like a little butterfly wing I once had a butterfly wing that I, I worked from seems like um, there's a meditative quality to working in the, the style you do of really focusing on these details and um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as it gets, as time goes along here, um, it gets more and more focused and more and more detailed. And, you know, I, like I'm putting in these shadows and then I'm coming back and sort of refining the shadows a little bit more and the shapes, the shapes of them. Does it start to feel somewhat sculptural to you as you begin like having articulating sort of the yeah, folds and def mm -hmm. definitely, definitely. And I always tell my students, look, look for the, the darkest areas, start in the shadows, and then head to the, the lighter areas. Can um, you talk about some of your personal tips for mixing like ranges of greens when you're when you uh, well, so my greens, those? I mean, I just, I have a limited palette with um, a few blues and a few, um, a few blues and a few um, yellows. I'm like yellow and blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and I just, so if you see on this little palette, I have mainly just stick with uh, Indian yellow, lemon yellow, ultramarine, and Prussian. And between those, and then maybe adding in some sepia or something or raw or umbers. Um, I, I can feel like I can get the colors um, that I, I can get. 
let's see. Can you talk about how you layer without getting lines when you add fresh paint? So like when you, you put on the next layer, let's see here. Let me find a good spot. One, so are once, you working on a dry sheet now? Like is the paper yeah, dry this, down there? This, mm -hmm. is, this is pretty dry. So once I put it in, you kind of got to rinse your brush out and dry it. And then you can sort of, and then you sort of soften it out. People have different techniques like for this, like Sarah, um, she's on here, Sarah Roche. She, she has two different brushes that she holds in her hands. Uh -huh. um, so there's lots, there's lots of different ways, but um, there is, there are some like edges here that I'll want to come back and refine a little bit, but as I do more and more in layers, um, I can, I can work on those. And yeah, one technique, I'm, I'm not quite as <laughs> practiced in dry brushes you, but I feel like um, doing little fades too, where if you put down a little bit of paint and can um, take a little clean water to kind of fade it. Is that something oh, yeah, you yeah, use yeah, in your yeah. work as too? So yeah. That's, I dry my, br I rinse up my brush, I dry it, and then I can sort of like, but I blend it from, I go from the light area to the, to the dark area. Cause you want to leave those lights. So you don't want to cover, cover up those areas. Um, so the colors on, oh, on my palette, um, I had Indian yellow and lemon yellow. So maybe you could post a picture of it to your stories afterwards. Yeah. So we can give people a chance to check it out. And in this new palette that Maria is featuring, it's lemon yellow. And actually I do feel like in this particular palette, the lemon yellow, with the lemon yellow and the green gold and the jade, like I feel like you don't need another yellow in here. Yeah, that was our feeling. I was thinking yeah. that the lemon, we could, you can always warm up a yellow a little bit and mm -hmm, plants, mm -hmm. plants have such a often that bright lemon yellow. And why did you pick Daniel? Do you always work with Daniel Smith colors? You know, I, I'm a fan of them. Um, I've been using them since 1995 when I was, you know, young and just starting out in watercolor and having grown, growing up in Seattle and having them be made right in Seattle. Um, okay. I've always really appreciated that. And um, I think their colors are, are really, um, you know, vivid and, and handle really beautifully. I think too, you know, as you get to know your supplies, other paint makers are, are wonderful, of course, as well. I mean, like Winsor and Newton, I'm just not as exper experienced with. Um, the one thing I have learned with travel palettes is some brands will dry better. Like, I, I think it's really nice to be able to f make your own colors, like you've filled out, you know, your, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your palette. But some, some pigments, and I'm not an expert here, but they um, have a higher concentration of honey, like Sennelier paints, I mm -hmm, believe. Mm -hmm. And another one, oh, there, there's one more that the name will come to me. Um, I think M. Graham as well. So they stay oh, yeah, stickier. Right, right. And mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. the stickiness is really wonderful for um keeping your paints kind of um juicy but mm -hmm. for travel it's not as effective <laughs> because they can be a little make a little bit of a mess so sometimes i'll spritz i'll take a little spray bottle um and spritz my paints before using them to kind of freshen them up if i have um you know working from my dried paints oh, okay that's a good idea um so i am coming in and adding in a, um some of this the red reddish purple in in the center here so um when I paint actually I jump all around and mm -hmm. so I sort of like if I get tired of green I'll be like okay well now I'm gonna go and work on this and do you find yourself just working progressively with smaller and smaller brushes no actually I I stick with the uh I pretty much stick with the two or four uh -huh. yeah even for like very detailed so like today I was working on actually this is the center of the bok choy right so the, here's the center of the bok choy. oh yours has yep yours is a little more has more purple than mine <laughs> yeah let's yeah. see so the actual leaf somebody wanted to see the actual leaf it's it's right here Mm. Love well, that red is such a nice match you've got there, Lara. Yeah, it's it's working out. I think this I'll have to go through and make, this. Is, it's more yellow than I have, so I'll have to. You can always put some yellow on top of, like this looks a little a little bit on the blue side, but you have a nice yellow here, the lemon yellow. 
So like, see, even just washing over with a little bit of. Do you do um, journaling with your kids? Um, no, I mean, I try to, but um, they find stuff for me to draw, which I consider an achievement. <laughs> so, ponies and horses at least that's what my my almost five-year-old always wants me to draw <laughs> oh gosh um, let's see what brand is the green gold i'm not sure these are all daniel smith in um in this palette right yeah oh. i didn't know if they were asking about from my other palette oh i'm sorry yeah Do you um, have a no my, my, uh -huh. my kids are um oh she doesn't see it's not green gold it was uh what was the color? It was, oh yeah, is that a, is that a, she's saying it's not on the Daniel Smith card. Yeah, it's on a, uh, it's called green gold. Um, it's on their big dot card, I think, if, if they, they may have a couple different dot cards. Um, and the other green is jadeite. Can I show you something fun that um, I think I'm going to pull out to play with? Yeah. Um, I had a nice conversation a few weeks ago uh, with Simi from Rosemary Brushes. And this is this tiny oh. brush called an Eradicator. Uh -huh. And they're coming out with it in a travel version. And so one of the ideas with this brush is you can use it to like lift out little veins or soften edges. And, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I know, I know some people use it. I have one like that. Uh -huh. um, and I sort of, if I have to scrub out something, actually it works well on vellum. Um, uh-huh yeah that's cool yeah I'm kind of excited about it I um when I'm working on like painting icebergs I sometimes need to soften edges and things um can you uh talk a little bit more about creating um I see you're building up these darks really beautifully around um the uh the textures of the leaf and mm -hmm. um just looks like, you know, it looks like you're just drawing. Wow, you get such a nice tip on your brush. Um, uh, so building yeah, up is, those shadows. Yeah, this is the stage that I, I really like where it's like just adding in these, these um, little details here and using like the fine, fine brush. Um, sorry, your what brush is, is the, pretty dry too, isn't it? It is, it is. What was mm -hmm. the exact question? Sorry. I, I was sort of oh in, oh I get yeah, advice for like showing some of the undulations in the chart like what um it articulating those bumps and things yeah so like how to do that well so I mean really I'm looking I'm looking at the photo and and this this plant and so what I'm right now the way to get those mountains is the mountains and valleys is to just look where the shadows are and just put the dark dark where that shadow is and fade it out but leave these light areas so oh, I just love that you called them mountain and mountains and valleys too yes they, re they really are so um and then you can get like I like this cobalt let's see cobalt turquoise yeah cobalt, tur cobalt turquoise is nice for these shadows so then I'll come in and say okay there is like a shadow like and this is where it, it sort of can be a little more dry brushy. And then I'm really going to start to sort of draw in these little shape shadows, dry my brush, and then sort of feather it out. Or you can use little lines to sort of gradate it out. And then actually, um, the cool thing about some of these, these great brushes, like Kolinsky brushes, is that a lot of paint can like stay on them for a really long time. And as you keep painting, the paint gets sort of used up. And then you can use that as a strategy to sort of um, say, okay, I have less paint on my brush now. And now I can go into these lighter areas because uh, you've sort of used up the majority of the paint that's on the brush. So kind of let the paint work its way areas. off yeah. from the light, dark, exactly. darker value yeah. to lighter value. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a matter of just building up these, these little, these layers. And, she, and somebody, uh, Fran wants to know where she can buy the eradicator brush. 
Yes. Um, so we'll be carrying these as soon as they're available. Rosemary is building us a set. This is the travel version. So um, it can be better at this with my other hand, um, tucked into the case and really nice for travel. <laughs> I label all my brushes so I don't accidentally lose them. Um, and uh, they also make just standard eradicators in three sizes. That's on their website of Rosemary and Co. Um, and uh, do you, did you find you just gravitated naturally towards this sort of more meditative uh, process of painting? Or is this something you had, you feel like you had to really develop no, in yourself? No, I, I, I think that mo I would say probably most botanical artists actually paint paint like this it gets very it gets um tedious and slow and very detailed and very meditative so um if you if you were to watch any botanical artist it would um it would be this slow and precise and it starts off um sort of loose and then it just gets tighter and tighter and more detailed as you finish up the painting are you a music person as you work or listen to podcasts no. or have some quiet? Um, I'm actually kind of a quiet person. I know uh -huh. it's kind of crazy. But actually, right now, uh, as things are with both my boys home, it's um, there's a lot of interruptions. So um, I feel like now what happens is I work in smaller increments of mm -hmm. time, like 20 minutes at a time. And then um, and then I have to get up or do something um so it's not like it sort of used to be I used to listen to the radio like mainly podcast and talk radio stuff yeah. so I I sometimes feel I don't know if this is weird or not but I will listen to the same album or like same three songs on repeat when I'm working on a painting and it just kind of gets me into this space <laughs> and then wow. when I'm done with the painting if it takes me for a while I'm kind of done with that music because, or if so I'm working on a series, like I'll listen to the same album just over and over, especially if I'm like waking up early and working. And <laughs> wow. And how, um, how much time do you log on like a painting? You know, it depends on some of my big pieces, you know, oh, I don't know, like a week, you know. <laughs> yeah. But that's not working all day, every day, but, you know, putting in some, some of those chunks of time and. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like, I like that getting into that zone. It's really, it's really fun. I think it's part of why I, I, I'm an artist. I mean, there's, and there's a difference too. Maybe you feel this between doing field work and then like doing a more meditative studio work too. Do you oh, definitely. Have Actually, kind like, of a difference. Sometimes drawing outside can be, uh, I mean, it can be nice, but it can be a little hard if it's hot or buggy or, um, you know, too cold. There's a lot of things that are really nice about being in a climate controlled environment, having, <laughs> having like great light sur source and also like a surface to, to work on. Um, but sometimes I can get into that meditation outside, but. Um, Do you have um, like sort of a field kit you keep ready to go or a bag I, that. I do, mm -hmm. but really it's just um, my journal and a micron, the micron pen. And then um, sometimes I, sometimes I take the paints, but then if I know I'm just going to be um, and adding color later, I'll just take the pen. You know, it's kind of nice. Then you don't have yeah. too many choices about what to grab. Well, I always try to tell people, don't make it, if you make it where you have too much stuff to carry, I know you put together those nice sets, but if you have it with too much stuff, then sometimes it can be overwhelming. So, um, like, I can just throw my journal in, like, my bag. And I have micron pens everywhere. Um, <laughs> and I would take it, like, I would take it, my son does, um, they do extracurricular activities, or used to. And I, when I would have to go wait somewhere, like, um, I would bring my book. And I would add stippling or a little bit of dots or value to some of the pages as I was waiting. So. Oh, I love that. That's one of the, just the beauties of sketching. Do you have so any tours of your journal online? Um, well, if you look um, on my Instagram, I post it, um, the journal, like every third um, post is usually my journal. So, and I usually tag it with the hashtag LG Perpetual Journal. And so that's the ones that are my journal. 
I kind of, I don't show like all the pieces and all the full pages just for like um, image protection, but I just show like parts of it. I would like to publish it. So I'm, I would, yeah, I would definitely love to publish it. Do you have a My goal mic- for how many years you'll go with it? Well, it's getting really full right now. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really full. I use CPM Micron pens. And I use, I like size zero, zero three or zero, um, zero five. I used to do zero ones when I did the illustrations for the flora of Virginia. Uh That's what I, that's what I used. But then um, they were just, they were just too, uh, too thick. I used to always use, um, I'd go down to like a zero point. I, I, I get mixed up on the number of zeros, really little one, like 0.18 or 018. A rapidograph. I used to love rapidograph. Pens. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I still do, but they are pretty fussy with um, like altitude and pressure change. Oh, interesting. And yeah. Take a little bit of like love. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> the Stetler rapidograph. But I have a real soft spot for working with pen, pens, building up texture. I, I use. Raphael Kalinsky Sables and I like size two. So do you oh, teach this is or size you... Four. Uh-huh. I do, I do. Actually I'm I um but I haven't taught um in this new era I've taught only a few Zoom classes. I'm teaching a really big Zoom class, um, a perpetual journal class that starts Tuesday, and we're gonna meet once a month. And I will give everybody a prompt and a, do a little demo and send them off for the next month to go do that and start their journal. And yeah, so that starts on um, Tuesday. Oh, so cool. Do you still have room if anyone's interested in joining? I do not have room. I, I really maxed it out. And so I, um, but I am um, on Patreon, which I just sort of started. And so people can go there as a place to get resources like videos and um, supply list and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And are you still like, are there any um, other projects that you've got in the works? Are you still accepting commissions right now? I am. I just finished a uh, label for a wine, (laughs) wine bottle, which was super fun. And uh, there's some, a few books, but I'm just doing the illustrations for the books. So, that's that's been keeping me busy yeah so a few different little things so i feel like as we've been talking i'm starting to enjoy my leaf more i've been getting into it and yeah i've been a little loose on my veins (laughs) i i i I left them open to some interpretation i think (laughs) i think there's you know there's not just one way to do watercolor i mean botanical art definitely has a style that is sort of defined but um when it comes to watercolors i think it's all just about yeah having having fun and especially if you're doing a landscape like you do you want it to be it has to be looser than i do um the paper i'm using actually this is um what is this oh it's arches yeah is that a hot press it is a hot press now i've had a lot of difficulty i i've been like a user of Fabriano Artistico for ever and it's just got become so disagreeable and fuzzy and inconsistent that now I'm trying to find other paper and I do like the Moulin de Roy a lot but that's on back order so um Arches is good Arches is good just I like my paper really crisp and smooth so I can really get a lot of crisp lines to it and mm-hmm. so um, when the paper gets fuzzy, it's kind of, it's frustrating to me. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. I've been, I've used arches primarily. So it's the paper I know. I feel like that's one thing with art supplies is it's nice to experiment, but then when you find something you like, you sort of develop your vocabulary around it and it, mm-hmm. <laughs> but then well, so, they yeah. all have some variations too. So how big are your paintings that you normally, normally do? Uh, so in my in the field, I tend to work on a smaller scale, like, you know, five by seven. I do a lot of panoramas, so like six by 12-ish. 
Um, I'll sometimes carry around 15 by 30 wide sheets. And my biggest studio watercolor is um, about five feet wide. And that was oh, a wow. really, that was a really big one. Um, and, uh, but I did, I went to, I, I did a really fun trip to Greenland in 2013 to work with a marine mammal biologist um, who studies narwhals and polar bears named Kristen Lydra. And um, before that trip, I took a illustration, natural illustration class, mm -hmm. um, which was really fun. And so in Greenland, I had a great time doing like um, a hunter loaned me a narwhal tusk that had been recently oh harvested. So I did a really detailed painting. I spent like two days just painting as accurately as I could. And it was so much fun. <laughs> and I think I really appreciate some of the, you know, natural history style and, um, you know, in the field of trying to get a mix of like our interpretations and then as accurate as possible. I think there's, there's a place for both and yeah, for just sure. to get to know things. Um, so I've really enjoyed that, but I'm, um, something I'd like to practice more. So somebody asked, um, the model size of the brush. Um, so, um, it's actually, so this actually ends up not, this is not a Raphael. I'm sorry, but this, this one is, I use these a lot. Um, this is the 8408 and it has a cream tip on it, but it is either size two or, um, four, but there's 8408 and 8404. Um, and it's, depends it's the size i believe it's the size of the the top part of the brush anyways um these i love you can see this one's been used so much mm -hmm. oh hey sharon it's so nice to see sharon all the way from australia um she's okay so sharon uses arches um i still miss the good fabriano i look back at old paintings on it and i just like oh Oh no, I hope they yeah. fix it. So like here, here's, here's a painting on arches as I mm -hmm. did say, And I just still, I felt like this was, this is too bumpy for me, even though I can it, see, uh huh. But I mean, it still looks really nice, but I'm just, um, yeah, a little disappointed with that. Oh, that's so interesting. And do you, do you like like a brighter white paper or I know some papers actually I like touch more cream. I, I do like the non-traditional the off-white one because mm -hmm. I usually paint um in sepia I don't know if you you've seen that where mm -hmm. I just paint in one color and if uh, the sepia works really well with the cream so rather than the bright white but you know everybody has their preferences so there's a lot out there and I always encourage people like I don't know the the only way and so whatever works for you in terms of like paints brushes um paper the biggest thing i always tell people is just respect your paper and your supplies you know so uh you know i i have trace paper here i cover up my paper sometimes i even have like a cutout where i i cut out and this is uh like you can um you cut out a little circle where you're painting so you don't ruin your paper Ah, to keep really clean. Oh, that is such a good point. Because <laughs> when you've invested all this time and energy and you've got this bright, you know, this clean white background, yeah, how to yeah. keep it clean. Do you ever use like a lift or two or just use a little protection for the, the painting? I know some um, artists will prop their hand up a little bit. I, I don't, but I just have like my hand on the trace paper. Yeah. I do like Stonehenge. Yeah, um, Stonehenge is, is great. So do you ever transfer, use tracing paper to transfer images? Uh-huh. I do. If it's a very complicated one or if it's for a client, definitely I'll do that. Uh, but I, I'm not really one for drawing things multiple times. So I end up like just drawing it on directly on there. So have you found, oh, and then you draw. So with your studio work, you, you mentioned you, oh, in the field, you use primarily pen Mm -hmm, and then otherwise mm -hmm. you just dive in with brush or you dive in with um um paint oh yeah right so the field work so i view the field work and the field journal as somewhere where i can make mistakes and just explore and yes. just <laughs> you know really just have fun and so it's not about perfection for me 
Yeah. Now, when I come to the studio, that's more of part, that's more focused on, you know, getting it right, getting everything absolutely perfect. So that would be more planning out with yeah. the, this with the sketches and the colors and all those steps. I think it's so important to have part of your process be be free and a place to experiment like you've got with your field journal and even the fact that you have to keep some pages just for yourself like 100 you know yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well also the field of botanical artists we're, they're they're perfectionist and so it's it's really relieving if i tell people like oh you can you can make mistakes here you don't have to be perfect in the journal and that's actually people need <laughs> people like hearing that i'm like only you're you're gonna see this so it doesn't matter and you know it's about observing the plants and being out in nature and being mindful about those things. Do you have a favorite plant? Um, let's see. Well, I really like things like vines and roots. So those are, so they're not really like a particular plant. I have always been intrigued by the milkweeds. I think those flowers are so cool. And um, I love spring flowers, like the ephemerals, the ones that come out early. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of things like in the APACA family. You have, to, you have to tell me what those are. I'm a novice here. <laughs> oh, it's just funny. It's like the ones in the carrot family. They're just uh -huh. all the little parts. And uh, Let's see. But um, I love dried specimens. You know, I love things like nuts and, uh, and just lichens and winter stuff. I'm definitely more of a winter fall person i love leaves i love leaves that have holes um i like the beauty and the decay and the falling apart of things not so much the i don't care as much for the perfect flower sort of thing uh i there are so many people that paint flowers beautifully out there and i like to paint the more the unseen parts of nature the parts that might not be viewed as beautiful so Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, and I have one more question and then I, I yeah. come to the end of our time. But have you been surprised by anything in your journal with the perpetual journal um, yeah, yeah, throughout sure. the process? Definitely. Oh, wait, and I just wanted to acknowledge somebody said they loved it when they realized that they didn't have to be perfect. Um, so Raven, yes, I agree. Uh, let's see. So I've noticed that definitely spring arrives early and mainly that's with the buds bursting in the uh, maples. So when maple buds burst, they used to here, they used to open in uh, February, mid February. And now it's um, January. So, wow. yeah. So, so, and everything's earlier and, you know, well, we know it's, it's climate change. So, um, but so that's, it's, sad to see the happening in your backyard um there are parts that are very cool because you can really get to learn your plants like there was one year where i kept drawing the same like gall you know like a gall like an insect mm -hmm. gall and i saw it three years in a row and it wasn't until the third year that i was actually it had a leaf still on it and i was able to identify it as a hackberry gall and that was really rewarding so you will make change uh, like observations about the climate changing but you will also observe like things around you I know people that have been um live somebody said they have lived in a house for 15 years and it was only through the perpetual journal that they started drawing the tree in front of their house and figured out what it was oh and I love that I know it was so great and that's exactly what we're talking about let's see I feel like so much of that applies to right now too, where as we're traveling less, like an opportunity to see our home and neighborhood or little towns, areas with fresh eyes of yes. going out. And it seems like your approach is just so much in going out and asking questions and kind of meditating on the small details. So that's mm -hmm. really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So somebody asked about the brand of watercolors. These are um, Windsor and I'm sorry, Daniel Smith. All Daniel Smith. You should maybe. I think some mm -hmm. people probably want to refresh of your what your uh, 
palette is going to be or like when this will be launched or something. yeah yeah so this is coming um looking for uh, next week and it's a garden theme palette that'll be part of our palette of place series that um we'll have more details coming soon but it's got eight colors and um the colors are lemon yellow deep scarlet quinacridone pink carbazol violet phthalo blue red shade jadeite which is just a cool color it's it um, a primatech natural mineral uh green gold and cobalt turquoise and um i really appreciate you kind of running through its paces a little bit laura and yeah what, what I do like colors it. um what brand do you paint with also in your other palette you know what i am a schminka schminky colors do you know them the schminka I, I do I, I haven't painted with them very much yeah so you know how it is where like you start and somebody gives you some paints and I just didn't look back. And those are the colors that I have used. I mean, I definitely have added some Windsor Newton and Daniel Smith in there too. So I have um, definitely expanded my palette, but I definitely believe in like having a simple palette and a simple yeah. palette. And there's, there's so many great brands out there as well. I think just for me, I, I think the emphasis is on buying things that are the artist quality, you know, they'll, they'll be a little more expensive, but they will last longer and you'll get such vibrant colors and um, uh, mm -hmm. more fun to paint with usually. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so anything else coming up we should know about people? We can follow your work on Instagram and it sounds like you've got a Patreon. Is that linked to from your Instagram? Um, not yet. I, it's a still in soft launch phase. So just been word of mouth really right now. Um, no, um, well, I have my class that's full and, um, I'll probably just not be offering many more classes until the fall. So, so we'll um, stay tuned to your website yeah, and other, yeah. uh -huh. and then I've been trying to do, um, you know, some sort of live on Friday. So thanks for having me on yours. Oh, I'm I so thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> I like the um, two-person one. Um, I've done it with Sarah. And actually, you know, Sharon, Sharon's on here. Maybe uh -huh. Sharon, she's in Australia. She's a great artist. So maybe I'll ask her <laughs> if she wants to. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Sharon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The lives have been a treat for me personally to paint with different artists from around the world and, and try some other techniques. So I really want to thank you. Oh my gosh, so sure. much for coming with us today. Definitely, definitely. Um, it was fun. And um, thank you to everyone who joined us. We'll have um, this recording up in my, um, I think the IGTV and in the next week, I'll be sure to post a recording too to the Art Toolkit Learn page. So we we'll hope to have these available. And um, uh, yeah, so thank you. Sure, you're so welcome, Maria. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the uh, the little set. I encourage everybody to check it out. Oh, you're so welcome. Uh -huh. well, and everybody enjoy your weekend and, um,